Hello, guys and girls. We are going to have an exciting episode today. We are going to interview one of the best and the brightest mind in the container landscape on AWS. We have Robert with us. Robert, do you mind introducing yourself? Uh, thank you so much, Raj. It's great to be here talking to kind of your audience today. Thank you for having me. Um, my name is Robert Norfad. I hope you Rob. I'm a senior container specialist at AWS. Is that, what does that mean? I really focus on container services. What does good look like for running Kubernetes with Amazon EKS? What does good look like for running um, our container service there? So really happy to be talking to you and yeah, ni nice to kind of be on this channel. Excellent, well, welcome. So what are some of your technology interests and things that you are interested in, Robert? Of course, I'm really interested in containers, um, you know, running containerized workloads, um, but more specifically, I'm quite interested in like, what does good look like for running containers outside of an AWS region. So how do we kind of run those kind of for low latency workloads at the edge on customers on premises, maybe looking at AWS local zones. So what does really good look like for running workloads at the edge, geo distributed Kubernetes clusters? How can I run containers anywhere and everywhere? Um, that's why I'm really interested in say, what does good look like? So from a consistency perspective, how do I operate those containers at scale across different geographic locations? things like multi-cluster management, um, et cetera. So for me, it's really passionate about how do I run containers at the edge for low latency or kind of meeting kind of regulatory um, requirements. And that's what I'm kind of interested in specifically. Got it. And talking about hybrid, does that also cover running containers on on-premises if someone wants to run Kubernetes on a data center? Uh, does that cover that? Oh, exactly. Yeah, that, that's at the edge, like running, basically running containers outside of kind of our AWS region. So whether that is on-premises, in AWS local zone, in AWS local zone, um, yeah, or maybe on AWS outpost. And so really, like, how do you operate those workloads when they're ge geographically dispersed? And exactly, yeah, perfect. That's why I call it, that's why I personally call a hybrid containers. Running stuff or extending AWS to your kind of data centers, um, so you kind of have that kind of consistent experience. You work in AWS, Robert, AWS jobs, full-time demanding jobs with travel and everything. At the same time, you, you study and keep upskilling yourself. How do you manage time to uh, study and upskill in addition to having this full-time demanding job? I, I think this is an excellent question. And I guess you can always say yes to everything because everything can be super interesting if you're interested in the topic. But I think the key thing for me, I think my suggestion would be to look at your calendar management it's really important to kind of block out time in your calendar for yourself, whether that's for learning a new technology, looking at a certification, blocking out some time just to kind of reflect on your week or plan your future week. So really kind of use your calendar, kind of your mechanism. And if you do block out your calendar and schedule repeated time, use it, honor it, um, just say no. It's okay to say no and say, hey, actually, can this wait till tomorrow? I, I spend my Friday afternoons maybe um, looking at a new technology or really deep diving into a particular topic. I think today I spent my time really deep diving into Bottle Rocket even more. I, I'm really interested in kind of uh, container runtime security and um, Bottle Rocket. So that's kind of how I spent um, a bit of my afternoon um, today. So do like block out your time, block out lunch, block out kind of your travel time. Kind of that's kind of my, my best practice. Kind of split your calendar into kind of you kind of got those big boulders, those like, big topics you're working on, um, and then kind of schedule um, that way. And that's my top tip. And it's okay to say no as well. Do, do, it is okay to say no to activities and kind of suggest <laughs> alternatives. Or maybe kind of, maybe you want to help support that person, mentor, scale yourself, um, et cetera. You deal with a lot of uh, Kubernetes customers and Kubernetes is becoming like the abstraction layer across uh, on-premises, different clouds. So what are some of the trends on this area that's popping up more than others? Yes, this is interesting. So I'm definitely seeing, I, I think we were both at KubeCon um, not so long ago, and definitely, there's definitely a theme cropping up on how do I run kind of stateful workloads on Kubernetes? What does good stateful workloads look like on Kubernetes? Whether that's running kind of streaming architectures like Kafka, Pub, Sub stuff, that maybe like Redis, or even kind of AIML framework. And there's definitely a theme kind of moving from this kind of running stateless workloads to, yeah, it's okay to run stateful stuff on Kubernetes, but what does good look like? So I'm definitely seeing more of a data on EKS type stretch. I know there's some really mm. good links that we can share um, from an AWS perspective um, there as well. 
and, and something else, another kind of key area that I'm kind of seeing, like the second point, is around cost optimization. Um, and how do I provision the right size compute for my pending pods and my workload? Um, and definitely, I think this is where Carpenter comes in. So Carpenter is kind of an alternative node autoscaler or node provisioner for Kubernetes that tries to help you provision the right size Amazon EC2 instances for your workload at a time. So really, these are the two topics I'm kind of seeing is how do I do cost optimization for my kind of Kubernetes clusters and kind of what does good look like for stateful workloads um, on Kubernetes? Also, I would say that cost optimization looks much different now than before. I feel like it is more evolved. Customers have caught up with some of the basic stuff and they are diving deep on some of the areas uh, that they probably uh, was not paying attention. So on that note, what are some of the advanced cost optimization tips uh, that you would give to our customers? Uh, I guess some of the most challenging things can be around how do I choose the right CP request and memory request for, for my workload. We've got these cluster water scaling techniques to scale our workloads out and scale them back in. Um, but ultimately, it all depends on how do I right size my container. And often, you might feel I'm going to I'm going to naturally have a bias to over provisioning my containers because you might not be quite sure what the right kind of CPU and memory and request limits are. are. So, I think mean, that's kind of the key thing. You really want to look at how do I right size my containers, looking at tools like Kubecast that can help um, produce recommendations over kind of a certain time window or other frameworks there. And that's kind of really one layer. And the second layer that you might start looking at is kind of things like network traffic, ingress and egress. Um, I know recently there's a feature in Kubernetes called topology where hints, the topology where routing, with the goal to kind of keep traffic of replicas between services within the same kind of fault domain, whether that's an AWS availability zone, et cetera or not. So kind of really looking at costs from a, not just from a compute perspective, but also a networking perspective. And then also you start to talk about stable workers in ETF, we start to about storage. How do we choose the right storage for our workload, the right IOPS, um, the right availability, the right durability, um, et cetera, there. So really don't just look at the compute, focus really on right sizing your containers first, focus on leverage different auto scaling mechanisms like Carpenter or Cluster Auto Scaler, and then start looking at kind of networking, storage optimization, and go from there. But there's definitely a lot of tools in the marketplace that can kind of help with kind of this thing. Okay, so the question I, I get a lot, Robert, is if someone is starting to learn Kubernetes today, right? Imagine yourself learning from today. How, how will someone master this, uh, this technology? I mean, just wow. It's like a really, really broad ecosystem. Yes. Uh, you got the CNC, there's so many incubating projects, so many graduating projects. And it's a really good question, like, where do you start? Mm -hmm. I think the way I like, I personally like to be hands-on. I like to try stuff out. Um, so I would definitely start with learning the core concepts of Kubernetes. So things like Kubernetes deployment, the basic deployable units like a pod, what's a Kubernetes service, what's a Kubernetes ingress. And then try and work back to a workload, maybe build a sample project. Build a project for a streaming architecture. And what does that kind of look like? Build a asynchronous workload, build a synchronous workload, and explore with deploying that to Kubernetes. And maybe experiment with like, just play with it. Maybe install something mini key on your local laptop, try and deploy this workload, evolve this workload over time, and kind of use this as your project and kind of get familiar. And that's really where I would try and start. And then once you've kind of done that at Kubernetes, don't just start with Kubernetes. Maybe you start looking at how do I get some more cloud native architecture? Maybe looking at kind of functions as a service, um, looking at things like Lambda, um, more native. So kind of take the same workload and try and mold it around different services and different capabilities. And that's how I'd get started. In addition, you can, you've also got kind of all the certifications, the Kubernetes certifications. Um, you've got Udemy courses, there's, there's lots of places. But personally, try it, just get started. Have the pain points, have challenges. And then, yeah, go work back with some kind of the core kind of 101 principles. And related to that, if someone wants to get a job related to uh, containers or DevOps in general, do you have any tips and tricks on how they should uh, prepare or what helped you get the job at AWS? Definitely. Going back to kind of the earlier question of like, how do I learn Kubernetes? How do I learn how yeah. these technologies? Create a GitHub profile. Start creating little projects, start experimenting, start learning. Um, 
start trying to get involved. Maybe you want to try and get involved with an open source project. Maybe reach out to that new incubating project that you're interested in. Maybe see if you can get involved um, with that. Start kind of building like a portfolio of kind of experience and say, hey, yeah, I, I learned this on, in this X, Y, Z scenario. This is what I learned. This is what I would do differently next time. And really do kind of play with the technology. I think as solutions architects, it's, not, it's super important. Not only do we kind of design low level designs and high level designs, but that you're also hands-on, you can play with the technology and really deep dive to understand how does it really work underneath? It might not be as simple as, uh, as it appears. And that'd be my suggestion, build a portfolio, create some GitHub projects. Maybe start writing some blogs as well, like sort of submit talks to conferences as well if you, once you get to kind of that stage. QCon, accept open submissions. Start submitting talks and ideas uh, and maybe attend local meetups. I think there's a meetup.com website where you can meet people that maybe interest in Kubernetes or cloud meetups. Attend these meetups kind of so you can kind of meet people that might be in a similar. Uh, another question I get a lot is, do you need to know coding if you want to become a solutions architect? That is a good question. And I think in the container space, I think it can be super helpful. So typically when you talk about containers, you often talk to platform architects, um, Delta engineering teams. But I think to really understand what makes a good workload for a container, having that developer experience does help. So for example, as a developer, you'll understand what does good logging configuration look like? What does good config, how do I externalize my config for my workload? And then you'll start as a, maybe a container specialist, you'll start understanding what makes a good workload, what are the good requirements are. So I think it's, it's important. You don't have to be the best and greatest programmer to be able to design patterns, but I think it's a good way to understand, yeah, this is what the developer workflow looks like. This is the developer experience, um, et cetera. Got it. And when you say code configuration and stuff, do you mean the programming language or were you referring to more like infrastructure as code uh, and the container code such as like Helm, the package manager, that kind of stuff? Yeah, so in that example, it was more the application code and application configuration. Okay. So when we think about what makes a good containerized application, the first thing that often comes to a lot of minds is a 12-factor application. Yeah. Um, configuration is externalized. We're not kind of building it into images. Um, logs are streamed to kind of a, a destination. Maybe the container runtime could be doing that for you. And I think as a developer, if you understand how to kind of configure some of this stuff, um, when you go to kind of container space, you can talk to kind of the developer and say, hey, I think this is what good looks like for you. So it's very much the application configuration. But then from an infrastructure perspective, we should also treat our infrastructure like we do our applications. We just have like a CI, CD pipeline stream structure as code. We're actually using Terraform, AS Calformation, or maybe kind of a CDK um, type experience. So kind of really treating our infrastructure the same way that we treat application code is pretty important as well. So it's a bit of both. A bit of both. Yeah, yeah, well said. At this point, I'm gonna ask you some rapid fire questions that Robert does not know for you <laughs> folks, right? So uh, hopefully, hopefully we'll get some uh, interesting answers. All right, Robert, favorite movies? Oh, it's gonna be Limitless. I, I quite like kind of Limitless. Um, it was, I mean, it's a really good movie kind of using both parts of the brain. I think it's really fascinating. Um, but yeah, pretty limitless. Limitless, Star okay, Wars, yeah, Brad, Bradley, Bradley Cooper was in that, right? Yeah, yeah okay. Definitely the Star Wars ones. Um, and also the Fast and Furious, there's a huge kind of Fast and Furious movies as well. Uh, I kind of like the-, the Yeah, I love Star Wars. Right? Fast and Furious, family, like uh, Van <laughs> Diesel, right? <laughs> nice, <laughs> yeah. regarding Star Wars, uh, who is your favorite character? Oh, um, Oh, Chewbacca, definitely Chewbacca. Chewbacca. Most, the, the most hilarious character. Um, but yeah, so many, so many. Okay, favorite, favorite music band? Oh, this is a great question. So I think I kind of started off kind of in like ACDC, Motorhead, uh, kind of a bit of rock, Linkin Park. That's kind of the joy. I don't really have a favorite band, I would say. I think I more kind of listen to a bit of everything, but around the ACDC, Motorhead um, kind, of, kind of phrase is probably my most favorite, my most popular choice. Um, but I also listen to guys, the UK Top 40 as well, it, while at work. So I have really bought, I don't really have a preference. Okay. I'm gonna ask you this because I'm a huge SCDC fan myself. What's your favorite SCDC song? Oh, probably Back in Black. Um, okay. Probably, um, nice, mine is TNT, but yeah. That, TNT, that's okay, TNT, yeah, that's, that's very distinctive. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, what's your favorite technology, Robert? 
Oh, I, I'm, I'm going to be really biased here. I, I, definitely, it's going to be containers in the cloud. I think when I when I first I remember when I first used, started using the cloud, I was like, wow, I have all of this stuff at my fingertips. Um, and yeah, I, I think it's definitely got to be the cloud. I think mean, you can now sit at home and build whatever you want with all the building blocks you need without having to kind of secure hardware. So I still like same with like buying Raspberry Pi, same with the physical hardware, buying switches. But yeah, it's definitely got to be the cloud and container technology. Dream uh, vacation destination. Oh, dream vacation destination. This is great. Um, I love traveling around kind of Asia. I think Japan is fantastic. I love traveling to Japan uh, during cherry blossom season. I've only been one. Uh, I would love to go back again. Um, so definitely kind of Southeast Asia, Asia kind of um, area. But I don't really have a specific, not a specific one place. Um, yeah. Okay, okay. What's the one thing you are most proud of? Oh, this is a this is a really um it's a difficult question I, um yeah I, I think it's kind of like one thing for me i think quite humble is to one of my like being able to kind of transition through different roles throughout my career mm -hmm. i think i really like i think i've been really lucky for some really good opportunities and i think that's what i'm proud of it now i might not hopefully created some but i think it's really humble to have some really good opportunities throughout my career, I think very much that sort of as a DevOps engineer, kind of moving kind of software engineering into the kind of tech glass, which is space. I've landed here, which is fantastic. Really love uh, working here. Excellent. Xbox yeah. or PlayStation? Oh, definitely Xbox. I was a Halo. I used to play Halo. Um, I think it was Halo 1. I didn't have the 360. I had the original Xbox, yeah. Do you still <laughs> play video games? Not, 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 not really. No, I kind of, um, not as much. I think I... Used to play things like Battlefield, uh, Battlefield 2, etc., but not a, not, a, not a daily gamer anymore. <laughs> Got it. Well, yeah, that, that's all my questions. Uh, so it seems like you, you have a lot of diverse interests, which is great. Uh, all right, Robert, any parting tips, tricks? How can people reach out to you? How can folks uh, get more of Robert? Uh, what, what is the best way? Definitely reach out on LinkedIn. Um, I, I'm not so active on Twitter, so LinkedIn is probably my preferred. <laughs> Um, and citizenship, yeah, just like play with technology, learn and be curious, like really play with the technology, get hands on. Um, it's okay to make lots of mistakes when you're playing with technology. It's a safe environment. Get a sandbox kind of playground environment and just play with technology. And that's, I think mean, that's my personal uh, takeaway. But yeah, it's been absolutely, thank you so much, Raj, for having me on the channel. I think it's been really great. Trip. No, of course, thanks for coming. For viewers, we have been planning this for quite a while. Uh, we recorded uh, some stuff in KubeCon, but it was so noisy that the sound was not that great. Uh, so glad that we put this on the calendar and got it done this time. Uh, thank you, Robert, for coming. Uh, viewers, if you have any questions for Robert, uh, put, put in the comments. I'll also give all his social uh, LinkedIn and all the links in the description. Check him out, uh, connect with him. All right, folks, that's it for this one. I'll see you guys and girls in the next one. Bye. Thank you.